Hello everyone and uh, welcome to another interview at Room for Discussion. Since March 2020, the world has been turned upside down. The coronavirus pandemic has had widely felt economic implications with governments, central banks and economists trying to deal with growing debts, discussions about the effectiveness of fiscal policy compared to monetary policy and rising inequality. Luckily today, we have the great honor of discussing these issues with one of the most influential macroeconomists in the world. Olivier Blanchard has served formerly as chief economist of the IMF and is now active as a senior fellow at the um, Peterson Institute for International Economics, which is one of the most important think tanks uh, for economic policy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Blanchard. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mr. Blanchard, uh, a Washington Post feature on you that we were reading said that uh, many people, or some people at least, would describe you as quite intimidating. Now, we're speaking to you now, we spoke to you on Monday as well. You don't really come across as in intimidating at all. So we're wondering, do you have an idea why people would think this? God knows. <laughs> you asked the hardest questions. <laughs> no, no. I, yeah, I, I'm not trying to intimidate. Uh, I don't know. Maybe because I'm six feet two. I don't know. Okay, it's the height. <laughs> We thought maybe it could have something to do with um, your function as chief economist of the IMF, which is quite an intimidating function, uh, we think. We were wondering, what does a chief economist of the IMF do? Well, it's actually, um, it actually, you actually have two jobs. The first one is your director of research, and the other is your economic counselor, which sounds very much like a 19th century type uh, <laughs> position. But so the first one is director of research, you basically have to think about what the important topics are, and then, you know, uh, make sure that research is done. Uh, and then the other is you advise the, uh, the managing director and uh, directors of the other departments on what should be done, uh, can be done, the decisions which have to be taken vis-a-vis -vis either general issues or particular country programs. Uh, I went there in 2008, I accepted the job before the crisis, and I thought that I would focus much more on the research part. And, you know, I would also give advice, but uh, trying to basically build the research. It turned out that, uh, you know, there were urgent issues to, to deal with, so I was much more involved in the uh, advising part. Uh, I tried to, you know, make sure that research was actually happening. And I think we did a, a fairly decent job. Uh, but it turned out to be much more an online type of job, mm. in which I, you know, you had to have a position on web, whether you should help Greece by how much, but whether you should go along with this or not. Um, so that's a description of a job. I think it depends on the times. It depends on the circumstances. I think my successors had quieter times uh, until the COVID crisis mm. and could focus more on the research part. I think uh, Gita Gopinath, who is now the uh, chief economist, you know, surely has to think a lot about what to do with the COVID uh, implications. Yeah. So we understand there is the policy aspect that's attached to it. But regarding the research aspect, how does a chief economist of the IMF, how does that job differ from being, for instance, an economic economist? It's the same job in the, well, in the sense that, you know, you're dealing with the issues that uh, if you're an academic, you can take, you can work at a much higher level of abstraction. So you write a paper which doesn't have direct implications in terms of policy, but allow, allows people to think differently about something and needs to more papers. That's a process which is typically fairly long. Uh, you have years to write your paper, then the paper has some influence and it takes a decade for the influence to actually show up in more applied papers. You don't have that luxury at the font. You uh, do not do fundamental research that's left to the academics, uh, but you try to see how the next step happens, which is how do you basically get these general principles into actual policies? Do you lend to this country or do you ask for restructuring of the debt? Do you allow a country to use foreign exchange intervention or not? What is your position on capital controls? So you're basically at the end of the chain. You're you know, facing the reality and you have to say, yes, do this or don't do that. Or what we know suggests that you should do this. So again, I think there's a continuum from you know, highbrow theorists to 
academic macroeconomist who are not highbrow, slightly lowerbrow, yeah. to uh, the IMF, to uh, economists in banks, which have to think about what the GDP number will be next quarter, which is a very different type of exercise again. It's interesting that you mentioned this continuum and um, yeah, the, the reality that uh, economists at the IMF have to deal with, because in the period that you've been active as chief economist at the IMF, you've been known for your efforts of trying to yeah, implement a more Keynesian approach toward the economic policies of the IMF. Why, why is that? Well, probably because I'm a Keynesian. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. <laughs> uh, I, I see the world <laughs> through uh, a general Keynesian framework. I mean, to, you know, in one sentence, I think that in the short run, uh, what determines outcomes is aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is affected by many factors, but is affected by policy, whether it's fiscal or monetary. And in the long run, you tend to go back with a bit of luck, not always, to something which is more classical, in which supply and demand uh, both play a role. So that's my general view of the world. Uh, that's how my research has been organized. That's how I, it's a filter through which I look at the world. When you, when you look at the world, it's an incredibly complex thing. Mm. You need some structure to organize your thoughts, right? And the Keynesian framework uh, is, to me, a fairly natural framework uh, to work with. So, you know, this is what I took with me when I went to the fund, whether the fund was thinking completely differently. No, I think the fund was in many ways in the same framework. Uh, but when it came to more applied practical issues, such as the role of fiscal policy, it tended to be in a slightly different place from where I was. And so part of what I did at the fund was to argue that, let's put it this way, the fund was closer to something which is known as a Washington consensus, which is a very free free market approach to economics. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be free trade, there should be free capital flows, the government should be uh, relatively limited in scope and so on. I think that was, if not the dominant view at the fund, it was a very influential view. I had a different view, which is that free trade is very good, but it has shortcomings. Fiscal policy is sometimes essential. And I came with these things, and part of what I did was to argue for my positions. So that's actually very interesting that you're uh, mentioning your positions um, toward economic policies when you entered the IMF, because right now we are facing an enormous economic crisis as well. And we would like to touch on the lessons that we've learned from 2008 and how, we, how these are reflected in the 2020 approach. So mm -hmm. could you maybe elaborate on how the 2020 IMF response shows the lessons that are learned from 2008? You mean this time, the response this time to yes. the COVID yes. crisis? Well, I mean, the font has been very clear about the fact that uh, the crisis necessita necessitated a very strong fiscal response. The position of the fund has been monetary policy should be used, but there's not a whole lot of room to use it because be even before the COVID crisis, the interest rates were very low. Um, the central bank should provide liquidity. It has been very aggressive in saying, please provide liquidity to markets, to investors, which might be short of liquidity. And on the fiscal side, do not hesitate to spend. There is actually more room to spend than the previous IMF might have uh, suggested. Um, I think this has been the message. Where was the lesson of the financial crisis or not? I don't know. But this has been the position of the fund in, in that uh, in that crisis, in this crisis. Yeah. So regarding that enormous need for liquidity that the IMF um, has granted in this crisis. One of your main arguments um, in a Princeton economics presentation was that the role of central banks and international institutions would primarily be um, yeah, coping with the enormous need for liquidity. But um, you stated that the virus should be granted through, uh, the virus should be financed through grants and not loans. Why is that statement specific for the 2020 crisis? Well, what happened in this crisis is that we forced uh, 
and for good reasons, uh, a number of firms to de facto close or at least operate at very low levels of activity, right? Close in some cases, restaurants. And as you know, in France, we're doing it again this time. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do this, uh, you don't want the firms which are closed to go bankrupt uh, because in principle, when COVID is, is gone, which we don't know exactly when this will be, or at least is under control, uh, these firms should be viable. So you don't want to let them go bankrupt uh, and you don't want the workers who work in these firms to go hungry, right? So it's clear that in this case, you have to help the firm survive. Now, what has happened is that initially this has been done through a combination of grants and loans. Uh, the state has allowed them to pay taxes later, right? Which is in the first loan. Uh, it has guaranteed the loans made by banks to firms so that banks were willing to lend to firms at generous terms. This allowed the firms to survive in effect uh, until now and from the beginning of this year to now. Uh, if we now have new lockdowns, right? Then if we do the same thing, then these firms are going to be subject to, you know, are going to have to take more debt on. And there's a level of debt at which they will not be able to function. So I think as these new lockdowns come, uh, the combination of grants, gifts on one side and loans on the other side will have to be different. Are there... We can't burden the firms more with more loans. We'll have to either forget, forgive the old loans or, you know, uh, give more grants. Are there any uh, conditions attached to these these gifts in terms of policy or certain economic indicators a country has to meet in order to be legible? No, I would. Uh, yes, I mean you, you you don't want to give loans. You don't want to make gifts to firms which don't need it. Mm. Uh, so there has to be some criteria mm. for which loans are going to be forgiven or who is going to get grants. That's clear. But, you know, if you think about restaurants, for example, it's fairly clear that uh, you basically want to allow them to get access to cheap loans or even to forgive uh, some of the taxes. And, and they, what do you think the IMF could have done better looking to the next crisis, whenever that is? Sorry, what the IMF, you said? Could do better. You know, what was In this crisis? crisis? Yeah, yeah, looking to the future. I think so far the IMF has done, has done very well. Um, you know, it has basically provided liquidity uh, to a number of emerging market countries. At the very beginning of a crisis, there was a large outflow from a number of emerging market countries. This is a liquidity issue. And then the IMF was basically able to provide liquidity. It was not the only player, but was one of the players. I think it did the right thing. Beyond this, it is now working on a number of programs. Uh, there are countries where which are going to have a need for just not liquidity, but uh, for for help, mm. uh, you know, solvency issues rather than liquidity issues. And the IMF is working with a number of countries on programs to basically help them, um, you know, be able to borrow in order to do what they need to do from a fiscal point of view. Um, so this is in play, and I think it's done well. And then in terms of general advice, again, I think one of the issues was whether the IMF would tell countries, well, be very careful about spending, or just do what's needed. And I think, again, relating to a discussion we had 10 minutes ago, uh, I think the IMF gave the right signal, which is, yes, please spend. On, that, on that point, do you think that that change in response, well, what do you think? Do you think you've had a, a contribution to that change in response? You know, do you see it maybe as somewhat of a, a legacy or something? You were a key player in trying to implement um, these ideas into the IMF, and now we've seen in 2020 compared to 2008 a more fiscal policy-based response in line with your your philosophy. So, do you, do you see yourself having a contribution there, or is it due to other factors? Yeah, I think you know. I, I think that. Uh, uh, I have made some contribution and maybe I have slightly changed the debate, but I was struck at how the thinking about debt was based on a world in which the interest rate was, was high, 
And therefore, when you had more debt, you had much larger interest payments and it became an issue. And that we had moved to a world in which the interest rate was much lower. And the discussion on that had not evolved in line with that change in the environment. Uh, and so, uh, as, as, you, as you probably know, I, I basically worked on this and gave a paper two years ago saying, well, in a world of low interest rates, the way we think about that should be different. There's much more room to use it, and it makes sense to use it if you have, you know, essential uses, uh, very useful uh, things to do with it. And I, I suspect I've contributed to this evolution, uh, but, you know, it was coming, I suspect, uh, even if I had not been there. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll never know. But, um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll take this time now to move on, actually, to the, the debt and deficits part you just mentioned the the paper you wrote in which you list out your arguments for why we should not necessarily be too worried about high levels of, of public debt so could you just yeah for the audience give give an, an overview of what your arguments are yes the argument is, is is twofold the first one which is nearly simple arithmetic which is when the interest rate is is very low and technically, when the interest rate is less than the growth rate, then it is much easier uh, to control debt. Uh, the risk of a debt explosion is much less. And you can think of it in very simple terms, which is that what matters, why would you worry about the level of debt? You would worry that you have to pay high interest rates times a large amount of debt and that you may not be able to do it. So what matters conceptually in terms of debt sustainability is not so much the level of debt, but the level of debt service, which is the product mm -hmm. of debt times the interest rate. In a world in which the interest rate is low, debt service, other things equal, will be lower. And if you look around the world at this stage, yes, debt levels have increased, but debt service is in many countries very low relative to, to the past. So my argument was, it's stupid to think of just the level of debt. You have to think of a level of debt service. Mm -hmm. And then there is more room to play with. You can increase the level of debt and still have a level of debt service that you can manage. So this was uh, the first argument that there was more fiscal room, if you want, uh, to, to do things. And that turns out to be incredibly useful in the COVID crisis today, which I not, clearly not anticipated two years ago. <laughs> but it shows that governments are able to borrow much more, increase debt, the interest rates remain very low, and therefore there is no debt crisis around the corner. The other argument which was more subtle is that maybe the cost of debt from an economic point of view, just not a fiscal point of view, was actually lower. The usual argument is if you have an economy which is operating at potential, and you issue more debt, then people will save more in the form of debt and less in the form of capital, right? For a given saving, they'll have to absorb the debt and therefore what will remain for capital accumulation will be smaller. Is this the, uh, the crowding out theory? This is, is that... the crowding out yeah, yeah. argument. Uh, and it's a very intuitive argument. And, you know, even in the economy as it is today, uh, it is a correct argument, which is that other things, when people save more in the form of debt, they save less in the form of, of, of capital accumulation. And the argument, the traditional argument, well, that's bad because less, less capital means less output in the future and therefore cost of debt. Right? That's quite separate from the previous argument. This is... It's, a, it's a welfare argument, not a, a fiscal argument. This is different from the fiscal yeah. argument, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it says, yes, there's plenty of... The first argument was there's plenty of room to increase debt. Mm. Right. The second argument is, well, you know, how costly is it for the economy? Even if you can do it, what is the cost? And what I argued is that the fact that the interest rate was so low was an indication that the risk adjusted return to capital, which is what the safe rate is conceptually, was low. So that although we were accumulating less capital as a result of, of that, other things equal, uh, then the cost in terms of lost output might be smaller. But basically, the marginal product of capital, if you want, was relatively low. But we were in a world in which, for some reason, the uh, marginal product of capital was relatively low, and that's a world in which 
that is less costly than it would otherwise be. That's a separate argument. And I think that's an important one. Okay. Well, your, your, your arguments, both these arguments, depend on the safe rate, that, that is the interest rate on safe assets like government bonds being lower than the growth rate of the economy. And you argue that this actually, you know, has, well, show actually that this has been the historical norm. But can we expect this relationship to continue in the, the post-COVID world? That's issue number one, right? Mm-hmm. Because if we did not, if we thought that interest rates were going to increase substantially in the near future, then I would worry very much about the level of debt because I would think that debt service would, you know, if might be low today, but might be very high in two years, and then we would have to do drastic things, maybe restructure debt, maybe default. Right. So that's an absolutely central issue. And uh, there is no certainty about the answer, obviously. But my sense is that it's very, very likely that interest rates will remain very low for a long time. And that's based on, on various arguments, which I think build up to a very strong uh, overall argument. The first one is that interest rates are low now, but it's not mainly due to the COVID crisis interest rates have been decreasing the safe rates, the rates on sovereign bonds of countries which are seen as reliable, uh, has been decreasing since the mid 80s. If you basically draw the picture of the rate over the last, what is it, 35 years, uh, it is basically a more or less continuous decline. It went down a bit more during the financial crisis as central banks were trying to help, but it is basically a trend uh, down. So it is a very strong trend, downward trend. And, you know, it has been going on for so long that it's unlikely to just reverse suddenly and just move up. Uh, why is the trend downward? Uh, downward? There has been a very large amount of work on what could be behind it. And I think it's a combination of reasons. Uh, it's there is what is known as a savings glut, which is that emerging market countries accumulating large reserves, which is a form of saving. Um, People being worried about the future, precautionary saving being fairly strong. This would lead to a large amount of saving, which other things equal would decrease the interest rate, right? Um, That maybe there are not that many great opportunities for investment, so that the demand for saving or investment uh, is relatively small. This would also lead to a decrease in the interest rate. And then there has been, has been the argument that there is a demand for safe assets, an increased demand for safe assets, partly because of regulation, partly because of other reasons. Uh, for example, the Chinese do not want to hold US equities. They want to hold short-term treasury bills. Um, and that has led to an even lower rate on safe assets. People are willing to hold safe assets at a very low rate because they really value the safety of it. I think all these factors have played. So when you think about the future, you have to say, are these factors going to reverse? You know, are we going to have an investment boom? Are people going to save less? Are uh, emerging market countries going to no longer want to hold large reserves? I think the answer is no. I think these things are there for a long time, right? So kind of a structural approach to your question is, well, this has been going on for a long time. The factors which were behind it are probably going to be there for a long time. And therefore, we should not expect interest rates to increase very much. The other way of thinking about it is to, to look at markets, right? And to look at yield curves. And as you know, uh, yield curves in many countries, which is you know the, the relation of interest rate to the maturity of a, of a debt, uh, uh, yield curves in many countries are negative at the low end, right? short maturity, and very low at the long end. I mean, you know, France can borrow uh, at uh, about 0.5% 30 years out. Mm-hmm. So the French government can issue debt today, right, and basically be sure that it will pay 0.5%. No matter what happens in the future, basically, this is locked in. Uh, in Japan, same thing. Uh, the interest rates that the Japanese government pays on its debt are negative up to 10 years and about 0.5% again at 30 years. So it's clear that the investors are willing 
to basically commit to these very low rates, right? In addition, what you can do, and this will be the last uh, part of the argument, you can look not just at the yield curve, which kind of the average belief of the investors, but you can look at option prices, which basically tell you how confident the investors are about what's going to happen. Uh, you can do this and then you can derive the implicit probabilities that the investors see on interest rates increasing uh, to X percent any years out, right? So to give you numbers, if you look at the implicit probabilities that the investors put on interest rates being more than 4% in 10 years, right, uh, is less than 1%. Basically, they think it's not going to happen. Why is 4% an interesting number? Because again, in the end, the crucial issue is the interest rate relative to the growth rate, the nominal growth rate. And, you know, our best guess of a nominal growth rate is something like 2% for real output, and then 2% inflation, which is 4%. So another way of saying what I've said is markets are nearly sure that the interest rate minus the growth rate will remain negative for the next 10 years. So if you put all this together, you conclude that nothing is ever sure in life, but there is a very good chance that we have, you know, 10 years of very low rates. Now, what this says is, you know, if we need to spend today to fight COVID, which I think we need to, and especially if there's a second wave and we need to spend more, it's going to be scary and that is going to increase. No question about that, to have levels we haven't seen in a long time. Uh, but in principle, debt service should be okay for quite a while. I think and if interest rates start increasing, then we have time to, you know, see what we do. So that's the long answer to your question. Yeah, I think uh, I think there is, as you, you know, just highlighted, many reasons to expect interest rates to remain low or, or even negative. I think maybe the more interesting side of the, the equation is the growth side and so one of the the arguments you gave for the decline in interest rates has been um the the, the lack of demand for investment and there's an argument enrico perotti an economist at um, amsterdam this university has argued that that structural decline in real interest rates is evidence of a lack of valuable investment opportunities and he uses this in his argument to to argue for expecting zero growth and moving towards a zero growth economy and that the interest rates declining is actually you know, part of that story. So yeah, what, what do you think about the zero growth argument and how does that affect our, our view on debt? So I think that the fact that the marginal product of capital is, is low uh, doesn't imply that the growth rate is going to be zero. Uh, that's you know, in, in economics, one of the things we teach when we teach growth is the solo model, uh, which is, you know, was, uh, was, was, uh, was derived by uh, Robert Solo from MIT. And the point he made, which is a fundamental point, is that the growth rate is determined by the level of technological progress, the rate of growth of, 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 of the rate of technological progress. The amount of capital accumulation determines the level, not the growth rate. Right. So in an economy which is saving less or investment is less productive, then you're going to have the same growth rate, but at the lower level. So it is possible, uh, given that it takes time to go from a high level to a lower level, that growth will be a bit lower than it would otherwise have been. That doesn't imply that growth will be zero. That depends on the rate of technological progress. And on this, we have very little sense of what it's going to be. There's a very strange puzzle, which you know, around us we see enormous changes uh, in in the way we produce things, in the way we use um, the uh, the net, and so on. But it doesn't show up very much in the in the estimated rates of technological progress at this point. Um, there is something we don't fully understand there, but I see no reason to think that it's going to be much lower in the future. It's quite interesting that you bring this up because. Um you say that we may not have to worry about debt as much as some people are saying. Um, but then you also talk about this self-fulfilling negative spiral where at some point debt gets so big that it scares investors. They start wanting higher returns on their investments. This causes interest rates to go up 
which then makes debt more expensive um, to service, which leads to more risk, more scared investors, and so on and so on. Right. We were wondering, where do you think that threshold is for this negative spiral? When does it start? We have no clue. Uh, that spiral can start at uh, 80% uh, debt to GDP ratio, or it cannot start at 250%, yeah. uh, as is the case in Japan. Uh, it's clear that there can be multiple equilibria, to use a technical term, in sovereign bond markets, and we see it in emerging markets, right? If investors get very worried, for no reason whatsoever, but they ask for a much higher interest rate, they ask for a large spread, uh, they may just self-fulfill their worries uh, and lead to uh, exposing, exposing debt. That's a very serious issue. The question is, what does this imply in terms of debt policy? Well, this implies that you probably don't want to go to 400 or 500 percent debt to GDP because then almost surely this would happen. Uh, even if it was technically possible to remain at the low rate, investors would freak and it wouldn't work. So I think empirically, the point is that it's about as likely to happen at 120 percent of GDP or at 80 percent of GDP. I think it's very unlikely to happen if you go down to, say, 20% of GDP or 40% of GDP. But that's completely outside the realm of things that we can do. You know, even if we had fiscal austerity today, we would decrease the debt to GDP by a few percent a year at most. So we would never get to the really safe zone. So we're always going to be in this zone in which you have to worry about what investors are going to think. Right, rating agencies, for example, are going to say and so on. So what do you do? Well, I think you think about why it is that investors might freak, uh, freak out. Uh, there's some reason, even if you know there was no good reason, there's something which is going to trigger. So it might be the feeling that the new government in country X is utterly irresponsible, no matter what the current level of debt is, right? Uh, it might be some event which makes them think that this would be more likely to happen. But in the current context, I think the ways of avoiding this, which is a serious issue, uh, are, are twofold. The first one is, I think it's important to send the message when we're increasing debt, as we're going to do this year, next year, to say that you're doing this because of COVID and you don't intend to do it after COVID and you credibly establish that the measures you're taking are COVID related and will stop when COVID is no longer an issue. So you try to be very credible about the fact that yes, there's an increase in debt, but it's not irresponsible. It's a response to something which is you know, urgent, uh, but you're basically going to go back to stabilizing debt thereafter. I think that message is much more important than the level of debt that you get to in response to the COVID crisis. The other is to use central banks uh, to basically make sure that the bad equilibrium doesn't happen. And I think that the uh, central banks have some ability to do that. That's what the ECB is doing, right? In the case of Italian debt, uh, in the late spring, it looked like investors were in that kind of self-fulfilling mm -hmm. loop in which they were worried they were increasing the spread and this could have led to a debt crisis in Italy. The ECB has decided to basically intervene in the sovereign bond markets, including the Italian one, and has decreased the spread substantially, right? And conceptually, what it has done is eliminate this bad equilibrium, which could have happened, but by making sure that they were ready to buy whatever was needed to avoid it, they have avoided it. So the answer is, we have to worry about the self-fulfilling equilibria, uh, but the best way to do it is not to just try to limit the debt today, that would be stupid, okay? But indicate that you're responsible as far as the future goes, and then have the central banks, be it the Fed or the ECB or the, uh, the Bank of England, intervene when they see something like this starting to happen in the market. So on that point of um, not 
that, that it would be not a great decision to deal with the debt today, we will have to manage the, this debt somehow, someday, right? So you stated that we can't reach 150 debt to GDP ratio in the long run, but it's actually already over 100% in some major economies and it's still rising. This basically means that future generations are going to have to bear the cost of current spending. You're talking to an audience of students right now um, who are going, yeah, who are aware of the astronomical heights of uh, the debt right now. Could you maybe give us a cause for optimism? Yeah, I have, uh, I have good news for you. Relax. <laughs> That's <Perfect>. great. <laughs> uh, there's a good chance you don't have to pay anything. Uh, because again, if we are in a world in which uh, the interest rate is less than the growth rate, then we actually don't need to raise taxes to decrease debt over time. We just have to limit uh, what we call the deficit. So there is a path of adjustment in which debt decreases relative to GDP, in which we never have to increase taxes, right? Not on me, not on you, <laughs> and not on you when you're older. Um, Mr. Blanchard, I think you're fr oh, frozen. So I had, I had lost you for uh, oh, you're back. my, yeah. my, inter my internet connection is, is, is not entirely reliable. Uh, so going back, I, I suspect you'll be able to edit that part. Uh, going back, how, you know, who is paying basically for what we're spending today? It is the investors in the form of very low interest rates, right? So this is very unusual. In the past, the standard answer, if, you know, if I had taught a course in macro uh, 10 years ago, I would have said the way we pay for the debt is indeed higher taxes in the future and therefore future generations, people like you. We're in an environment in which it's very paradoxical, but you're not the ones who are actually going to pay for it, most likely. It is the investors today who are accepting extremely low rates, in some cases negative rates, in order to, uh, to hold the debt. And these are the people paying for it, not you. So I hope I've reassured you about your <laughs> future income net of taxes. Well, we'll call you in uh, 20 years' time. Oh, he's got it. I'm safe. I've spent you. <laughs> You'll have to find the right phone number. <laughs> yes. One of the one of the strategy we've seen in trying to deal with this debt is, um, particularly with the Bank of England, for example, is the effective merging of fiscal and monetary policy with the bank printing money to to directly finance government spending. For the audience and to get you know get an idea, for people who maybe haven't followed this so much, how radical a policy is this? I think that's not the way to describe policy. I think what the central banks are doing is basically trying to achieve the interest rate, which would sustain demand and need you know, demand to be equal to potential output. They do this, and then the government is able to borrow at that rate, right? So I don't think thinking in terms of you know the central bank directly financing the government is not the right way to think about it. But so. I would describe, you know, it's the usual division of labor. The central bank tries to achieve a very low rate, right? Not just to finance, to allow the government to finance itself for cheaper, but to allow people to borrow for cheaper as well, right? That's what the central banks do. And they do it in various ways. And we can discuss, you know, how they do it at this point. And then anybody who wants to borrow, whether it's the government, whether it's firms, whether it's households, can do it at very low rates. Right. That's the usual division of labor. I think that's the way you have to think about the division of work between the central bank and the fiscal authorities. Now, the other point is that in a world in which bonds basically pay zero, there is very little difference between money and bonds. Could you yeah, right. explain, that, explain that concept? Well, I mean, what's the difference between money and bonds typically is that bonds pay interest, mm -hmm. right? At this stage, bonds basically pay no interest. So, again, I don't think it's a useful way of describing what's happening, but it's another way of thinking about it is that at this stage, if a government issues bonds, which pay zero, or it pays, and, and then the bonds are bought by the central bank, which then issues money, which pays zero, it's more or less the same as the government issuing money, you know, through the intermediary uh, and, and paying zero. In a world in which the interest rate is zero, Financing through money or financing through bonds is more or less equivalent. 
But I don't think that's the most useful way. I've said that, but I realize that's actually confusing. And I would go back to what I said three minutes ago, which is a way to think about the division of labor at this point is the central banks tries to have very low rates so that anybody who wants to borrow, whether it's a government, the firms, or the households, uh, can do it at very low rates. And then anybody who wants to you know, seize the opportunity, the government in this case, but firms or, or households as well, uh, can borrow at very low rates. I think that's the way to think about things. So um, we would like to talk about um, another concept, which is inequality, because you're releasing a book in February with uh, Danny Roderick, um, and it's, mm -hmm. it'll be called Combating Inequality, Rethinking Government's Role. For our audience, could you maybe give a brief synopsis in a few sentences what it'll be about? Well, there are, there are two parts. The first one is you know, documenting inequality. And what we understand is that there are many, many dimensions, right? You have inequality in terms of income, you have inequality in terms of wealth, you have inequality in terms of health, and then you have inequality for intergenerational inequality, which is, you know, do the kids of which parents are richer or not and things like this. So what we have done uh, in, in, in the conference that you refer to, which will come out as a book, is basically document these various dimensions. Then there's a question of uh, what has happened. And the answer is what has happened is that in general, there has been an increase in many of these dimensions of inequality, although the increase has been much, much, much larger uh, in the US than in many European countries. I'm now working on the uh, same issues in France and the increase in inequality is rather limited in effect. But it, it, it's there in various dimensions. So if you think this is an issue, the question is then, well, where does it come from? And so it comes partly from technology, partly from trade. And technological progress has basically led to a hollowing of uh, middle income jobs, uh, you know, kind of manufacturing jobs that we think about. Some of these jobs have become high skilled and some of these jobs have become low skilled. Uh, and this has led to an increase in inequality. The other is trade, uh, which probably plays much less of a role, but is much more salient for people. They think about trade as being a big issue. But, you know, we know of examples in which uh, a manufacturing plant in Europe uh, is closed and then, you know, uh, the same thing is done in China and therefore some good jobs are lost. So these two factors are clearly very strong factors. The interesting thing is that, again, we think that this affects most countries in the same way, but when we look at the outcomes, it's very different in the US and in Europe or in Scandinavian countries and, 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 and other countries. And so it says that, yes, these forces are at work, but institutions matter very much, right? Some countries are able to control this much better than others. So the general picture is these two forces are there, but institutions matter very much. Then the last part is what do you do in terms of policy, which is what this conference was largely about. And there, the way I think the best way to put it is there are three phases in which you can deal, try to reduce inequality. You can try to do it pre-production. So you may want to basically level the playing field, give good education to everybody. So decrease inequality in terms of human capital, to use this uh, economic word. And then the same thing maybe in terms of financial capital, you may want to tax inheritances much more so that some people don't start with you know large amounts of, of money and others not. So you can work at those margins and clearly you can do more than, than has been done. There, there is large inequality in education, for example, and then um, you have uh, very strong inheritance aspects uh, to the transmission of wealth. Uh, you can work after production. You can say, well, some people are paid very little and others are paid a lot. So let's redistribute progressive income taxation, for example, is an, is an example of what you can do. But you're dealing with the consequences of these underlying trends. You're not touching the middle, which is intervening in the production process itself. And maybe we can do things. And there you get to issues we 
we're just starting to think about, which is maybe you want to affect the production process so as to decrease inequality at that at that stage. So maybe you want to put restrictions on trade so that some of the good jobs don't disappear, for example. Or you may want to try to twist or tweak technological progress so it is more labor friendly uh, than not. It basically creates good jobs rather than destroys uh, good jobs. Now, conceptually, that's very appealing. Practically, what does it mean? And uh, this is very much what uh, what the book that uh, uh, Danny and I uh, organized uh, uh, and then the work that I'm now doing in, in France is, is, is about. Yeah, so what's interesting is that um, one of the points that you're making is that um, inequality negatively affects economic growth. Now, if you go back six or seven years ago when you were at the IMF, um, you weren't actually convinced of this point. But what has changed your mind in the meantime? I'm not, I'm still not convinced uh, of the economic channels. I think there are many interactions between inequality and growth, and sometimes actually inequality is good. Uh, it allows people, you know, with who basically accumulate large amounts of, uh, of, of wealth to actually do things that could not have been done otherwise it can happen at some stage or in some other context, it may go the, op the opposite way. Uh, so I think there, I'm not sure that the empirical evidence is really dispositive. It seems to me that, you know, it's a very complex set of interactions. Uh, and we should care about inequality, not because it affects growth, but because we care about inequality is so the, the, the fundamental point. I think, however, the political channel is much more relevant, which is that it's clear that inequality is one of the sources of populism. Uh, populism is, again, a very complex thing, but it's clear that one of the factors behind populism in the US, for example, is perceived inequality or the gilet jaune in France is another example. And so I think there, again, I think that channel, which is inequality leading to populism, leading to bad policies, leading to lower growth, that channel, I believe. Again, the reason to deal with inequality is not that it leads to populism, is that we want to reduce inequality. But I think that channel, I believe in very much. And diving into the causes that you uh, you were describing earlier, it's kind of, yeah, it's a split between two sides. The, the side that emphasizes long-term structural changes in the economy, so that would be globalization, trade, automation. And the other side you mentioned, um, the effect of, of politics and specific institutional and policy decisions. For example, a tax system that is, is friendly to, to big companies and, and to the wealthy. Which one would you say is the bigger contributor to rising inequality? It's not a well-defined question uh, because, you know, if, uh, if the underlying forces were not there, there would be no need for institutions to repair <laughs> anything. Uh, I think it's a mix. It, it depends on, on, on the country. I mean, it's clear that in the US, these underlying forces are very strong and the institutions are not doing much to uh, reduce uh, their effects. It's very clear that in Scandinavian countries, or even in France, uh, the amount of redistribution is is, uh, is much more important. So if you look at France, there has been some uh, uh, some increase in pre-tax inequality, uh, which is largely eliminated uh, by the tax system. So I think it depends on the country and the place. And one, one area we focused our, our research on is the declining power of, of unions particularly in, right. the, in the US. Um, how, how significant do you think this is? I think it's very significant. I think unions uh, traditionally, and, and are, you know, unions are not perfect, but if anything, I think they tend to reduce inequality. Uh, and uh, weaker unions lead to more inequality. I have no, no doubt about this. And unions are weaker for all kinds of reasons, having to do with globalization and changes in, uh, in regulation. Yeah, and I think definitely as well in the, the power of certain organized interests, particularly in U.S. politics, um, which I think we'll go into when we talk about solutions. But on the topic of, of unions, this kind of gets to the, the classic uh, 
equity versus efficiency trade-off in, in economics, that solutions and policies to improve equality will be detrimental to the efficiency of the economy. And unions are, you know, I remember learning about the effect of, the negative effect of unions on, on, on welfare or, or, or employment. Do you still, do you think we see this trade-off? Is it, is it really a no, thing? No, and everything is always more complex than this simple ways of, of stating it. Uh, there might be trade-offs between equity and efficiency, but very often they go the same way. Uh, and I'm quite sure that, again, uh, in a, for example, unions, I think, do extremely good things, uh, not only in terms of equality, but in terms of, uh, of, 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 uh, of production. Uh, sometimes uh, they take decisions which indeed create a trade-off. Another example is the minimum wage. Okay, so it used to be that, you know, if you took the first course in economics, people would teach you that a higher minimum wage would increase the wage for the people who get it, but would reduce employment, right? I think that that has been challenged. I'm, I'm quite sure that if we increase the minimum wage to $20 an hour or something like this, it would have those effects. But most of the empirical studies suggest that the effect is very weak or not at all there uh, for decent small increases in the minimum wage going up to you know 10 10 15 dollars in the us so i think sometimes there's a trade-off between equity and efficiency but i think it's a case-by-case -case thing in the case of unions it's not obvious that the trade-off is really there actually we want to talk about some solutions right now because i think it's a never-ending cycle for talking about the causes <laughs> of of inequality but since the crisis, the role of the state in combating inequality has become a major topic of discussion. What do you think the biggest tool is the government has for addressing inequality right now? Now, if I go back to what I said earlier, again, I think you have to work at all margins. So it's not, you know, it's not just increasing the minimum wage or increasing the progressivity of the income tax or having a negative income tax, all these things are useful, but you really have to think of the whole panoply, uh, the whole set of measures that, that you need to be taken. I mean, I think that to go back, you know, in terms of education, it's very clear. Mm. That's where inequality largely starts, which is rich kids get better education than poor kids. So in this case, why is this? Why it's there in most countries, but it's mostly there, it's more there in the US, and it comes from local public finance, right? Basically, poor neighborhoods have less money and therefore worse growth. Okay, so it's clear here that you have to work on whether you want the schools to be locally public financed or not. And I think the answer is you probably don't want that. So I could take the whole set of things that I've talked about, education, the uh, uh, estate tax or the inheritance tax, uh, the uh, negative income tax, restrictions on trade uh, to protect some jobs. Uh, all these things have to be used. Uh, I don't think there's any magic bullet which is going to solve the problem. And I think the way to do it is to sit down and look at all the things which can be done and do as much of each one as you can. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you're touching on, the what you mentioned as a pre-production um, type of intervention. But also one of the policies that are uh, that is being debated right now is a um, more progressive wealth tax or for instance a universal basic income um, but we were thinking how um, how politically feasible are those suggested um, controversial policies if we're taking a look at the um, yeah, the influence of politics on uh, inequality so you've taken two examples, and I think they lead in different directions. Uh, again, with respect to the wealth tax, I much prefer to think of, again, an inheritance tax or an estate tax to kind of redistribute the wealth every generation, or at least redistribute some of the wealth, rather than a continuous wealth tax. But there are arguments. Uh, what's, what's the arguments. distinction there, sorry, between an inheritance tax? Wealth tax is something you pay every year. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, the inheritance tax or the estate tax is something that when somebody dies, their kids do not get the whole mm. amount. Uh, 
right? So that everybody starts. So you can think of a wealth tax in which, uh, you know, the, when somebody dies, uh, there is a tax on the estate, right? And then these taxes were distributed to people who actually did have rich parents conceptually, right? That's different from a wealth tax. It has many of the same effects, but it's conceptually different. So what, what level would you have the inheritance tax then? I, that's uh, that's where politics comes in. Mm. Uh, I think people are entitled to help their kids a bit, uh, but not too much. What this suggests is uh, is a fairly high limit, uh, a fairly high threshold, uh, over which uh, this tax is is is, uh, is 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 applied. In the US, uh, basically, you don't pay the inheritance tax if you uh, have an inheritance of less than 11 million per person. I think that's much too high. <laughs> that's yeah. a lot. Uh, but, you know, what the right number is, I don't think there's a right answer to this, but there's a political answer to it, which is I think you want to protect people. You want to allow people to leave you 50,000 euros, say, to their kids or 100,000 euros without having to pay tax. After this, maybe you want to have uh, uh, an inheritance tax. Uh, so, this was you know, the first measure you, you took. This clearly, there are political limits as to what you can do. The other, the uh, universal uh, income, uh, you know, is very popular, <laughs> you know, because it's just money given to people. So who would object? Uh, uh, but I think it's a bad idea. Uh, I, I, I think it's much better to have, I mean, there's an issue, which is that some people have a productivity level which is not sufficient if they are paid that to live on. It's just not enough. It's not a living wage as, as it's called. And so the question is what do you do? So you can basically just give them money and that's the UBI, right? That's the universal income. Uh, or you can, I think, do something better which is to have a minimum wage which is sufficient to live on Okay, uh, which is not too high, and then a negative income tax. So that basically you get more than your productivity. You basically get something given by the government, given that you're working and your productivity is not very high, and therefore your wage is not very high. You basically get, an, in addition, uh, a, a gift in effect. But the key difference between that and the negative income tax and the universal basic income is that you're, it is slightly attached to, to work. It is attached yeah. to work. I think that's the main difference. So a system in which you combine the, the fairly low minimum wage and a fairly generous negative income tax gives incentives to people to work even if their productivity is very low. The universal income doesn't give any incentive to work. And there are plenty of examples of people who basically decide not to work. Uh, and I think that's not the way to go. I think this gets to a yeah, key issue on the discussion of inequality, that there is a major influence of politics um, and the political system on inequality and the policies that could be um, yeah, implemented for combating inequality. But if it's the political system that's contributing to causing uh, yeah, these problems that we've talked about, do you think that there is any option at all um, for, for instance, the private sector of depoliticizing this pro uh, the problem? and taking it upon itself to improve, the, for instance, the power balance between labor and capital or to um, motivate their employees to join unions, or for that matter? I think the private sector can go somewhere on its own. For example, I think that it might be in the interest of firms to change the governance of firms to give more power to workers. This may be in their own interest. Uh, to basically improve the climate in the firm or take better decisions. Uh, I think to hope that the firms will do on their own what's needed is an illusion. Uh, in the end, uh, firms are about maximizing profit. So they'll do some things which are good from the point of view of inequality to maximize profit. But in the end, I think profit maximization will remain the rule. It's very hard to think of a different way of organizing things. So no, I think that in the end, it has to be uh, the government's task uh, to, to improve things. And there again, yes, there are very strong limits to what governments can do. Uh, and uh, you know, business is much richer uh, 
uh, uh, than, than, than workers. And uh, if it's allowed to affect, not quite control, but affect the political process as it is in the US, for example, I think it's going to be very difficult uh, to change things uh, very much. Uh, I, I think many, many of our audience would agree it can. We had optimism earlier, but uh, maybe some a bit more pessimism now, at least particularly with the example of, of the US. Um, we look forward to, you know, to buying and reading the book. Unfortunately, that's really uh, all we can do on inequality today. But we wanted to finish with, with one last question, and we realize we're very short on time here, so we'll ask it quickly. Um, but taking a big picture kind of look to, to finish on, you, you're critical of economics being, this is our understanding, you're critical of economics being excessively ideological and kind of rife with theoretical division, but you're also, you know, you're wary as well of it being overly mathematical and abstracting so much from reality as, as to lose its value almost, its applicability. In light of these concerns, in terms of how it's conducted, its relevance, uh, the nature of the work that is actually going on in these university departments and in economics in general, how do you see the discipline today? So I think you misrepresented my my views okay. to some extent uh, on being too ideological. We're social science, which means that we're Bayesians and we start with views. And so some of us are more inclined uh, to care about distribution than others. Uh, some of us starts with different views of how society should be organized. And even if we do the work as objectively as we can, the final result will reflect in part what we found and partly what our views were, right? And just, again, good Bayesians. So you see this. And so you have economists who are on the right and economists who are on the left. I think that's, if they are honest, that's okay. And that's what the social science is about, as opposed to, you know, physics, in which priors about inequality don't play a big role. Right. So that that doesn't worry me. It seems that most of the research that I see is is, is good. Uh, how people then use it to push something or something else, that's where their views about the world come in. And uh, that's the way it is and the way it should be. On the, on the math part, again, there are excesses and some people become obsessed with, with the math part. But in general, I think math is precious. I'm absolutely struck at how uh, when I think about something, my intuition tells me something, and then I try to write down the equations, and I realize that my intuition wasn't quite right. Uh, that's basically what math does to a large extent. It forces you to be very precise. And then, you know, everything having to do with econometrics is clearly incredibly useful in looking at uh, what's happening in the world. So... Again, I don't have much of a problem in general. I see fashions, I see excesses, I see people being obsessed with the wrong questions uh, with or with mathematical issues, which are not of, of the essence. But in general, I have a very positive view of, of at least my field, mm. I suspect of others, but I only know mine. Um, and again, nothing is ever perfect. Not everybody is perfect, uh, but no, in general, I'm fairly happy with the state of things. I think the way, for example, economists have responded to the financial crisis in putting an enormous amount of work in understanding the financial system, uh, or the way economists are responding to the COVID crisis in thinking about what the best policies are, is absolutely amazing. The number of papers, of good papers, on COVID-related issues this year is mind-boggling. Right. So it's not as if economists are working on the wrong thing. They are working on the right things. Uh, they are trying very hard to help. Again, the quality varies. That's normal. Uh, but in general, I, I would give us a fairly decent grade. That's good. Going in the, the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard, very much for, for your time. This has been a, I think we've covered a lot, but I, I think you've done a, a ter like a really good job of getting into these complex topics in an accessible way. And yeah, I mean, I, I hope everyone enjoyed it at home. We just got a quick piece of admin. We have a, another interview today at three o'clock with Haiyun Chang, the economist, and the political scientist Thomas Ferguson, talking about the effect of corona on yeah, politics, the climate, the effect of corona on everything. Um, so yeah, be sure to, to watch that. And 
Once again, thank you so much, Mr. Blanchard. It was a, it was a pleasure. Okay, it was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you a great day. It. Thank you very much.